Hey everyone, happy Sunday and welcome to the Final Fantasy 16 discussion live stream where we'll be discussing mostly combat or potential combat. Uh, we'll also be going over the trailer scene by scene. We'll also talk a little bit about the game's rating and release. More importantly, I want to talk to you all about the kind of experience that I think we can expect from Final Fantasy 16 as a whole which is something I've wanted to discuss since uh, starting my channel about a few months back. 16's announcement was the catalyst that finally got me to start this channel for real, for reasons which will become clear. Uh, once we take into consideration Final Fantasy 16's development, uh, which we'll be discussing thus far and the team behind it, there's a very important discussion to be had regarding how 16 will position itself differently compared to uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake Part II, and the implications of that difference are potentially game-changing for the series. I've also been catching up on the modern Final Fantasy titles post Final Fantasy X in preparation, mostly in the past two and a half weeks as part of my kind of ringing in the new year. Final Fantasy XI, I haven't yet played this one, uh, though I've seen enough footage of it to get kind of an idea. Final Fantasy XII, I've played about 20 so hours of it, 13, I'm about five to six-ish hours into it. Final Fantasy 14, I played about 10 hours, and 15, I played about 15 hours. I've beaten Final Fantasy VII Remake already, as uh, many of you know. I am still finishing them all up as we speak, but I've played enough of each to at least get a sense of the combat and where I think 16's combat is headed. So as far as Final Fantasy 16, what do we have? We have the reveal trailer, titled The Awakening trailer that we got back in, I think, September. We're gonna be getting a rumored, rumored new trailer in February and March of this year, probably at the next PS5 showcase that's rumored for February. I don't think we'll be getting any Final Fantasy 16 news uh, at the February 5th Final Fantasy 14 announcement showcase. Uh, here's what I'm expecting for the next trailer or announcement. I'm expecting combat details more than anything. Uh, Yoshida even hinted at something combat related in a 2020 end of year tweet. There may be some Final Fantasy VII Remake news though at the next PS5 showcase rumored for February. Uh, Naftra, I think his name was, at Reset Era claimed that there'd be like updates to VII Remake's PS5 edition or PC edition or deluxe edition. Uh, we are coming up on the one year exclusivity window and he supposedly has a good track record, but you know, it is Reset Era which I've come to more or less associate with clickbait. Uh, but rest assured, any new Final Fantasy 16 trailer or events, I'll be all over it. We do have the official website that was released at the end of October, and it included the world, the map, kingdoms. We have three character bios. This is the map, the Final Fantasy 16 map I made based on all the website info. Of course, you know, this is all pending. Let's check on the site as I do every day. Uh, I checked the website, the Japanese version of the website specifically for any changes to the, the zero rating, uh, Japan's version of ESRB and PEGI. Uh, traditionally, the, the Japanese rating for a Final Fantasy game tends to determine the international rating. I know right now there is currently a, um, a provisional PEGI 18 rating on the UK and the Euro sites, which we'll also be discussing as well as a minute. But let's get to the first main topic of today's discussion, which is Final Fantasy 16's combat. Uh, and the reason why I think this is so important to discuss is that the combat, I think, is going to be very telling of many other things, such as, you know, how many characters we'll have in a party, if any, uh, what kind of characters we'll have, aka like job classes and roles, how the ability system will work, the character's relationship with the icons, and the character's relationships possibly even with each other. And even more importantly, I think what the combat will tell us a lot about is how much Final Fantasy 16 and to another extent, Final Fantasy VII Remake Part II, how much have they learned and evolved from the previous Final Fantasies, specifically because it's being helmed by Yoshida, Naoki Yoshida or Yoshi P as he's affectionately referred to. Right now, I think for me and a lot of Square fans, he's the one producer that we have the most faith in regarding Square learning from its mistakes, learning from the past, learning from know, what worked, what didn't, and being open to finding new solutions to those. Like his New Year's resolution keyword for 2021 was open mind. For those of you who know about him, you know that his 
natural penchant and willingness to learn and adapt was what saved Final Fantasy XIV. And he seems to be bringing that same mentality to 16 in spades. You know, and since A Realm Reborn, that same attitude has actually cascaded to all the Square developers, actually, uh, even Katase with the 7 Remake and its combat system. First off is random battles, where you, you, know, you kind of walk across a field or a map and you get the kind of swish sound effect and then jump into battle with uh, an invisible enemy that you couldn't see beforehand. Consider those gone. Those are pretty much dead at this point. Almost every modern Final Fantasy game, even Final Fantasy XIII, which did have that kind of swish mechanic uh, effect before engaging an enemy, uh, you have at least enemies that you can see beforehand and choose to engage or not. Random battles in past Final Fantasy games, they were mainly like a workaround of uh, hardware limitations, not being able to display as many assets at once on a screen. And it's one of the more I would say personally annoying things about classic Final Fantasy games and classic RPGs, uh, so much so that even the the remaster of 7, 8, and 9, they had options for turning it off. Enemy encounters in modern Final Fantasy games, they may respawn, but I think you'll at least be able to see them ahead of time before engaging, and I think Final Fantasy 16 will more or less adopt the same approach, or at least I can't see any good reason why it wouldn't. The flow of combat this, I think, is like the big sticking point. This is like the big roadblock that Square's been wrestling with, uh, evolving over the better part of the past two decades, and one that we're going to see the fruit of their labors of in 16 and 7 Remake Part 2. Combat in the mainline Final Fantasy titles are generally broken into four main categories. First is uh, ATB, which has like the active and the wait mode. Turn-based, and by that I mean true turn-based. There's cooldown, the cooldown mechanic, and then there is actual real-time action combat. ATB is Final Fantasy 1 through 9, basically. The bar fills up and then you can, you know, attack, magic, summon, item. Turn-based did have two modes, which was active mode, uh, where the battle actually continues while you're selecting an action after getting a full ATB charge, compared to the wait mode, where the ATB bars for both allies and enemies stops, when you're selecting commands. 16, I would say this, it's it's almost guaranteed at this point to have neither, actually. Just from looking at the trailer, I can basically guarantee you right now, it will not have anything resembling ATB at all. And it's also practically guaranteed that it won't be turn-based either. True turn-based RPGs are games like Final Fantasy X and Final Fantasy Tactics. There's a queue of turns, almost like a chess game, when a character has an active turn, everything stops until the character either acts or chooses to wait. And ATB combat, or what we associate with ATB combat, is actually like an active time turn-based combat. Turn-based is something like Final Fantasy Tactics. So you notice where every time a character has an action, everything stops until the character decides to do something. It's very structured, very procedural, very like cue. Final Fantasy X did something similar where you have like the queue of character turns. So next up is cooldown. I'm convinced 16 Combat won't have cooldown either. Cooldown was something that was introduced in, I think it was Final Fantasy XII. Cooldown is where you attack and then you recharge or cool down for uh, a few seconds and then attack again, which is sort of pseudo ATB based but the battles just go quicker. This was also implemented in Final Fantasy 13 and 14. In fact, you can see Final Fantasy 12's combat influence in Final Fantasy 14. The targeting lines, the attack recharge, the free movement between attacks. So you notice how the characters are uh, performing attacks and then there's like a cooldown. You see the little recharge, the yellow bar that charges back up and then it executes the next attack. So it's sort of a pseudo ATB based, but not exactly. What's actually different between ATB and cooldown is number one, the recharge is attack dependent instead of character speed dependent like ATB. So like stronger attacks have a longer recharge regardless of the character that's performing it. And number two, as you've noticed, you actually have free movement in between attacks while ATB combat usually has the character stationary. So what that does leave is real-time action combat, which is basically Final Fantasy XV and Final Fantasy VII Remake, if you took out the slowdown mechanic, where you can freely attack at will. I think Final Fantasy games in general, like most RPGs now, 
are moving towards a real-time dynamic action RPG combat, 7 Remake Part 2 will likely see its hybrid ATB action combat upgraded to its logical conclusion, but not 16. And here's the reason why. Well, maybe here's the reason why not. The benefits of ATB is that you expend charges where you're usually it's usually speed-based and you release special attacks, and you're issuing commands in queue, which can make the pacing and tempo of combat feel very structured. Like every action feels more calculated and deliberate. But the downside, and this is what I think Square's been wrestling with, is that you're often just kind of standing there and waiting to do something which feels very passive. Like you're just inputting commands for other characters to do as opposed to performing the action attack command yourself. So 7 Remake's hybrid ATB action combat system, it resolved this by allowing you to perform standard attacks in the interim while the meter fills up. And you know, like attacking and blocking uh, actually fills up the meter even faster. But ATB was still the key to victory because your normal attacks, as you've probably all noticed who've played it, it doesn't do very much damage relative to the special abilities. And the, the hybrid ATB slowdown mechanic was actually added to simulate the turn-based ATB combat of 7 Original. The ATB battle benefits don't really apply to 16 in the same way that it does to 7 Remake, especially if Ryota Suzuki really is on board as the combat director for 16. And I think it's all but guaranteed at this point that 16 will be a true action RPG combat, which is real-time button inputs and feedback with no hint at all of anything ATB-based or turn-based. The downside of turn-based anything is that the action is passive. 15 was sort of the test bed for this. As you can see, like there's no ATB bar, there's no turn-based anything. 15's got some pretty freaking fundamental flaws to it, but I think it was a necessary step in the right direction. There's a delay between the button input and the actual attack. Like you select an action, you wait for a character to perform it. And in some cases, the characters attack automatically after selecting a target like in 12. The delay I think was what Square has been trying to remedy since Final Fantasy XI in its attempt to move in the direction of action RPGs. In an action game, there's a direct feedback to your button presses. This is what Final Fantasy VII Remake did and what it did well. There's a direct feedback to your button presses. So like pressing Square instantly attacks and you get like feedback immediately and it gives your attack more weight. There's a physical connection between the character's actions and your actions. 15 was trying to navigate towards this more kind of real-time combat feedback, but its biggest issue was that you were actually just holding down a button to do attacks and combos. Instead of actually pushing buttons like in Final Fantasy VII Remake to like issue combos and shit, that made 15's combat feel less viscerally satisfying. Whereas in 7 Remake, each attack felt like an attack, like a punch and a hit and a, a swing. Real-time button input character action feedback, it's like the more fighting gamey style of RPGs. And that may not necessarily appeal to those who just want an RPG where you just input a command and then kind of passively watch as the action unfolds. But if Final Fantasy VII Remake and 15 are any indication, I think 16 will take the same route and improve on it a la Devil May Cry 5, as uh, many of you have pointed out. The downside of action RPG combat, and one that I think that 16 will resolve, is that depending on how many characters you have control of in a party at any given time, like here, you see how things are kind of getting a little bit chaotic, things can get a bit overwhelming and chaotic, especially when you're dealing with mobs, which is the appeal of turn base, because in a turn base, the flow of battle is very procedural and controlled. But given the influence of Final Fantasy XII on XIV, both story, lore-wise, and combat-wise, and given that 14 is being made by the same team as 16, given how much of a fan that Yoshida and his team are of Matsuno's work, I think how 16 might resolve this disparity and how they might implement a full-out action RPG with party members and not having things being too overwhelming and chaotic for like the casual RPG gamers, basically getting the best out of both worlds, I think is the Gambit system in Final Fantasy XII, how it works and why I think it's actually a very ingenious solution to the problem that I think 16 and modern Final Fantasy combat systems are trying to solve. So in a Gambit system, you set rules for your party members. So for example, if an ally's status is KO, then use a Phoenix down. If an ally's HP is under 30%, use a potion. Have this character target the party leader's target. And all of these rules are just stacked in terms of priority. The Gambit system gives you a far more controlled experience of your party's AI than say, 
Final Fantasy VII Remake where the AI just sort of like blocks and does basic attacks when you switch characters. You can control your party without controlling them in a sense, which is perfect for an action RPG. My third biggest prediction for Final Fantasy XVI's combat, which is character-specific combat. Character-specific combat, which is sort of what XV did, but I think Seven Remake did it far better. In character-specific combat, skills, animations, mechanics are specific just to that character and no one else, which will most definitely mean a smaller party, if any. Character-specific combat is what I'm noticing that Final Fantasy games, in the classic Final Fantasies, 9 I think was the culmination of this. And in modern Final Fantasies, 15 was where I think Square truly committed to it. But previous Final Fantasies did have like distinctive roles and movesets for some of the characters, like Final Fantasy 6 and Tactics and 10, and like certain character stats may align them to certain jobs. But for the most part in Final Fantasy games, the characters have ability crossovers and every character could sort of like learn the movesets of other characters, black magic and white magic, item, summon. What that means is that they can potentially be made useful in any situation. But the notable exceptions to this were Final Fantasy IV, Final Fantasy IX, and I think to some degree Final Fantasy XV, where character specific skills necessitated that you work as a team. So like, no, Noctis's warp strike is specific to him and its advantages are his alone to exploit within the team. I'm willing to bet money that Final Fantasy 16 will follow suit with battle mechanics that are unique to Clive and unique to you know, perhaps Jill and Joshua, similar to how it was done in 7 Remake, but possibly taken one step further, which I'll get to in a minute. 7 Remake, it allowed characters to equip any materia. So you can learn, every character can basically learn any skill, but their baseline combat mechanics and animations were character specific enough to make them useful in certain battle situations. Yeah, like Cloud's Punisher mode gimmick is, it's like it's unique just to him and it makes him useful in like counter situations, which there are plenty of. Same thing with Tifa and then her unbridled strength against staggered enemies. 16's skill system may take this kind of character specific combat one step further by having an icon junction system where Specific abilities can be learned by specific characters, even when junction to the same icon. The game has an action RPG system where the protagonist can do a shift warp as well as use summon attacks in his moves. It'll probably be something similar to some variation of 8's junction system, where you junction an icon and then there are like certain abilities that you can learn. In classic Final Fantasy, Characters gained abilities via like crystals and jobs, magicite, materia. In modern Final Fantasies, it's like the sphere grid, licenses in Final Fantasy XII, the job system and LP, the crystarium system in Final Fantasy XIII, where you had like primary and secondary roles. Final Fantasy XIV had you choose like a race and a class slash job that determines your equipped weapon. And your abilities are job dependent, which is also kind of Final Fantasy Tactics. Uh, 15 had the Ascension Grid, like a scaled down version of 10 Sphere Grid. Gladio, Prompto, and Ignis, they can learn new abilities via weapons, like equipable weapons, but the character specific abilities were very limited. In Devil May Cry 5, how you learned abilities was that you had to purchase them and every ability that you learn opens up a respective new skill tree what do I think that Final Fantasy 16 will use is that it'll be a variation of the Junction and Sphere Grid license system where you equip icons and each icon has a like a Sphere Grid, maybe like 10 or a skill board like Final Fantasy 12, where you expend the equivalent of ability points to gain abilities or stats, which in turn open up new abilities and each character slash icon Junction pairing has a completely unique set of abilities. For example, the that fire warp strike that we saw in the trailer, or the grappling claw uh, that pulls the enemy towards you, a la Devil May Cry 5's like wire snatch. What I'm really wondering is how much ability crossover there will be in 16. So if Jill were a playable character, for instance, she learns, let's say, flare from Junctioning Phoenix. Can Clive also learn Flare likewise? So if, if he has a warp strike, a flaming warp strike that is gained from Junctioning Phoenix, does another character who junctions Phoenix as well gain the same warp strike? Or you know, is that ability unique just to uh, him and her? And I hope the latter because I hope that you need to fully utilize your party strategically to win battles and not just kind of hack and slash or combo your way through battles as Clive Solo. Here's how a character specific kind of combat could work. 
So imagine if junctioning Phoenix to Clive yields that fire warp strike like we saw in the trailer, and junctioning Phoenix to Jill will yield Flare, and junctioning Phoenix to Joshua will yield Revive. See, and that's an example of how character-specific combat could also tell you a lot about the character themselves and the relationship with each other and the relationship with the icons. If Jill, she's more of like an, an offensive kind of mage, then it would make sense that she would gain like more offensive spells. And if uh, Clive is more about combat, then all of his abilities gained from uh, icon junctions are gonna be focused more on attacks and attacks based on his sword. Can dominance swap icons? Like right now, we know that each icon is tied to a dominant, but we don't know if there's something in the lore that allows them to like swap. And you know what that sort of reminds me of? This kind of character specific combat where you learn specific abilities for specific characters and, and under specific situations, it sort of reminds me of Trials of Mana, where the, the characters can utilize the abilities of all eight of the Mana Stones, but the effect is completely dependent on the character and the class that they choose. For example, Salamando, which is like a, a fire elemental, it grants Duran, who is uh, the swordsman there, a flame saber ability as a sword master, but it grants Angela, who is a magician, the spell like Blaze Wall. And it grants power up to Reese, who is like the Valkyrie. But to take it one step further, Salamando may grant Reese a power up ability as a Valkyrie, but it grants her the mind down or enfeeble ability as a rune maiden. So that level of depth and customization of combat that is specific to the character that gives you a reason to use them, that would be amazing. If I had to summarize all of this, what do I think 16's combat will be? I think it'll be an action RPG, like actual action with direct input and feedback. It'll be character specific combat. It might be like an interchangeable icon junction system. Other playable characters may be able to equip the same icons and gain wholly unique abilities. No more random battles. I think we're at a point where we're beyond that. Enemies may respawn, but you have control of uh, engaging with them. The level up mechanic in Final Fantasy games has not really changed <laughs> in over like 30 something years. So leveling up is probably more or less just gonna be done the same way as before, like you gain experience points, you know, some items maybe, and you gain like AP or SP or LP for the abilities. I think 16 might, or it would be best served using a gambit system similar to 12. The gambit system was, it was pretty ingenious actually in that game, albeit the rest of the combat was somewhat mediocre in 12. In 12, you selected a party leader and then you issued commands to your allies, but their auto actions were all determined by gambits. But you are still able to switch between them at will and manually take control. Here's the million dollar question, which I guess everyone is kind of asking. Will we even have a party? I think what it really boils down to whether or not we'll have a party is how involved Clive's combat is. I think that's the determining factor in all of this. For those of you who've played Devil May Cry 5, which I mean, at this point, it's more or less guaranteed that's what 16's combat is kind of modeling itself after. The button combos and the timed attacks in DMC 5 are insane. There are precise button presses and button timings in order to uh, chain and combo attacks. Somehow, I really doubt that 16 will go that far. But here's the thing, even scaled back, if the combat is leaning more towards character specific instead of character generic, maximum, I can't see a party of more than maximum five playable characters, and even that's stretching it, at least for the main game. Because if the combat is real-time action combat with DMC five level controls, or potentially even like combos, how are you going to juggle between four to five characters in combat, especially when the shit gets chaotic? Unless there's a gambit system, which is what I was saying. With a gambit system, you can control one character and sort of focus in on them a little bit better. And you can set the gambits for other characters and freely switching between them. Don't give us 20 generic playable characters that all more or less control the same way. Give us like one to five, like really well-developed playable characters and really focus on fleshing them out head to toe through gameplay combat and story. Or better yet, give us 20 well-developed playable characters that are super fleshed out. No, but I digress. I, I don't think even Yoshida can pull that off in any kind of a timely manner for a single player Final Fantasy game. It took seven remake, like what? Like years to flesh out the mechanics for just four characters in part one. We've determined enough to realize that fire will play a core role in Clive's story and his combat. Uh, since fire is tied to Joshua and the Phoenix and the tragedy that is implied 
to befall them. Fire is also linked to a revenge theme. The line that he speaks at towards the end, like, I'll kill you if that's the last thing I do. Something about that line and also some information on the website on Clive's bio about getting revenge on Ifrit, being able to wield the Phoenix's power, his attacks, at least initially, are being all fire-based. I think there is a there's a heavy emphasis on fire as a theme and fire in terms of combat. Uh, it's thematically important to the story and the combat. And only the dominant. How do we even know the girl will be among us? Our kind do not question orders. This war, most of this combat, I'm guessing, is cutscene. So using Chocobos as war mounts, that is straight out of Final Fantasy Tactics. An army of knights and these kind of Saracen dudes, they have melee weapons, but as you notice here, they also have spell attacks as well. There's some crazy freaking blue Hadouken fireball. All over. Oh my god, I love Sergeant, this. Summon their icon. Icon. So Shiva fighting Titan, okay, my feeling is that icons won't be summoned in battle. Because if you look here, and this wasn't uh, apparent to me at first, like summoning Shiva against Titan is probably going to be relegated to cutscenes. Because if you look at it, the size of these things, they're enormous. Titan is literally the size of a mountain. So how would you summon these icons like in a battle where you're fighting in a confined space like inside of a castle? And Seven Remake sort of ran into the same dilemma. Ifrit is huge and Leviathan is huge and Bahamut is huge. Either like logically or just programmatically, it just wouldn't make sense because they're so big. And I hope that's something that changes in part two. Okay, super violent, very violent. Our foe will not relinquish their mother crystal easily. Okay, the dog. <laughs> I think the dog might be an icon also. It'll become Cerberus. This will be a bitter fight. You should not. So Joshua and Jill. Joshua is Phoenix's dominant, confirmed. And I suspect still that Jill is Shiva's dominant, mainly because of her color paletting. She was a former princess in the fallen Northern Territories. The North does tend to be more ice. Uh, and I suspect that she probably doesn't even know that she's a dominant or that she's Shiva's dominant. Uh, I hope they both become playable party members. Joshua and Jill are instrumental to this kind of change between younger Clive and older Clive, the person he becomes. It's possible that Joshua and Jill may be, if we're going by tactics, they may be like guest characters during that portion of the game. Something happens and then possibly in the older version of Clive's story, one of them, or both of them, hopefully, may become playable characters. That's interesting, actually, if you can equip icons to specific weapons, sort of like the way you equip Materia. I think there is ultimately gonna be some kind of a junction system with the icons. I'm just not sure if it'll be junctioning to you, like as a person, or junctioning to specific equipment. That'd be cool, too. Doors. We have discussed. Okay, here, um, that moment you saw with uh, Joshua healing Clive's hand. The Famitsu October 2020 article also confirmed that Joshua can heal people with the Phoenix's power. So I think if Joshua ends up being like a playable character, he'll be more of a, like a defensive mage or a healer. And if Jill becomes a playable character, maybe, maybe she'll, she'll be more of an offensive mage. I am Joshua's shield. Joshua's shield? I'm sworn to protect him. Hinting at his class, perhaps? So Clive right here, okay, notice this maneuver. This maneuver where he's he's kind of warp dodging out of the way and leaves like an after image of himself. This is very similar to Nero's shuffle maneuver from Devil May Cry 5, or sort of even like Noctis's, like his phase shift warp, where like when you hold the, the evasion button as an enemy is attacking, he sort of does this like, phase shift. He generates a, a silhouette of himself to evade an enemy's attack and then counters. I think that's actually more Devil May Cry 5 than Final Fantasy 15. If you look in the background, there's a what looks like an NPC who's helping you in the battle. So I, I think it could like suggest a possible party and maybe temporarily you have, you know, this AI controlled party member. Here, where he shoots that flame blast attack. And we also see it here. So that flame blast attack that he's doing there, that might suggest combos. Here we see him doing Noctis's warp strike. What do you mean you refuse? Did you not pledge your sword to our cause? 
in this Marlboro fight, yeah, it looks like it's going to be a, a freakishly tough fight. Notice how he's shooting these fire blasts, fire spells, almost like a cannon. So there's no charging up and then release. It's almost like the fire is tied to like a one button press rather than an ATB command. Okay, another warp strike attack, a flame blast counter. The Marlboro attacks with the tentacles and then Clive, okay, he does the same shuffle maneuver. See, he leaves an after image of himself and he parries with the flame blast counter first. That might be the parry and then a warp strike attack. And then, ah, see, a uh, caliber movement. So in DMC5, there was an attack where you, uh, I'm sorry, there's a maneuver where you caliber, uh, which is basically like sidestepping out of the opponent's field of attack. And I think that's what's what's happening here. Because it looks like the, the Marlboro attacked first, he uh, shuffled, did a parry where he did a, a fire blast attack, did a warp strike attack, and then calibered across the the side of the Marlboro to get out of its field of vision. You see what I'm saying? The more I'm seeing of this, I don't see how this can be ATB based or hybrid ATB based or anything. I think it's pure action RPG. Uh, we see another cutscene of battle and armies that can use magic. So probably just like 12, there, there might be like Imperial soldiers and like Imperial mages. When I first saw this, I thought like, what the hell is this? This is like some damn Joker face. Uh, but this is Titan after what looks like an attack from Shiva. It looks like some kind of a, an evil looking face inside of a mouth. Mother Crystal, we cannot defend our realm from this yeah, that's the Archduke. The Dragoon. This is an Alpha Dragoon. So we see Clive, here's a strike, and then we see him using the Phoenix's power with some kind of a flaming hook punch. There's the Phoenix's wing. Uh, the Dragoon's attacks also look kind of wind and lightning based. Clive counters and the Dragoon, it parries that counter. We see the Dragoon fucking charging at you with the, what looks like a lightning tipped lance. Notice the crest, the, the emblem on the back of its cape and another flaming warp strike in the background, Rosario's flag. So they're fighting in the ruins of the castle it seems, maybe after a siege. Yeah, at this point, there's no freaking way, no freaking way that this could be ATB or turn-based in any way, or even cooldown. It's pretty much damn clear at this point that this is going to be real-time action RPG combat. This is called a Kuoro. It's been around since, I think, Final Fantasy II. He's doing the same attack that Younger Clive was doing. It's the shuffle parry where he, he shuffles out of an enemy's attack and then instantly counters. See? There we go. There's the parry. Oh my god, this thing looks fucking tough as hell. These enemies are freaking tough. They look tough. These are not stupid enemies that just stand there and get hit. The combat, as you can see, it does feel very much reflexes and like life and death. What you're seeing here is some kind of a, a troll or a goblin, but notice that there's some kind of a claw that Clive has thrown onto the, the creature's face. This looks like Clive's version of Nero's wire snatch. Like it's a claw attached to a wire that he uses to throw the enemy onto their knees. He pulls it and it slams the creature down to its knees. Maybe Bahamut's Claw, but I think it's Garuda's Claw. And it's possibly an ability that you learn via an icon junction and possibly an ability that is unique just to Clive. Clive looks like he is attacking with what looks like Garuda's Claws. Dude, how, look how sick this combat looks. We get two claws using it as like sights, like slashing forward. And if you notice in the background, you see that, that white structure. It's the same background as the previous shot where he was using that wire snatch ability. Here we see Joshua's father, the Archduke, being assassinated. I think it's an inside job. If you look at the soldier that is killing him, he's wearing the exact same colors and even the exact same type of chain mail. And it looks like the Archduke was taken completely by surprise. Older Clive is now doing the same kind of, uh, as you notice, the same kind of flaming hook punch that younger Clive did against the Dragoon. See, the, the same hook punch where he summons the Phoenix's wing. That is Rosaria's flag in the background, by the way. This enemy might be a Zanbrek mage, a mage from the, you know, the Holy Empire of Zanbrek. At first, I thought that the mage was jumping towards Clive, but if you look very closely, I think Clive is actually using the same wire snatch ability, the, the Garuda's claw, and he's pulling the mage towards him. He's doing a shuffle maneuver in midair where he leaves behind his silhouette. In DMC5, 
one of the gimmicks in that game was to earn an S ranking in battle was constantly chaining combos. And Nero would do that by either using a wire snatch to pull the enemies towards him, or if the enemy was too bulky, he would use the wire snatch ability to pull himself towards or zipline himself towards the enemy. That is Titan's Fist. It looks like Titan's Fist. And you can tell from the rock debris that's being splattered as uh, the fist impacts. Titan's Fist number one, Titan's Fist number two. Jesus, this guy's getting messed up. Look at the enemy's helmet. It's a Dragoon helmet. It doesn't look quite as powerful as that Alpha Dragoon that you fought earlier. The Holy Empire of Sandbreck might be either laying siege. Uh, scratch the 99%, I am now 100% convinced. This is pure real-time action RPG combat. I don't see how ATB turn-based hybrid anything can even factor into this combat. Yeah, and Phoenix is goddamn huge. Also note Rosario's flag in the, the background. Since the Phoenix is Rosario's icon, yet the castle is ironically going up in flames, Phoenix may have gotten out of control. As you're seeing in all this, 16's combat, it's shaping up to remove all resistance between you and attacking. So anything that slows down the combat, that deliberately slows down the combat, I think Yoshida is trying to get rid of. The stamina management, the reason why it was created in RPGs, and anything like ATB based or cooldown, it's all based on preventing you from attacking too much and killing the enemy too fast. Now what they'll do to compensate, I think, is just make the enemies tougher, make the enemies faster, make the enemies stronger and more buff. Ifrit is freaking huge, just like Shiva, Titan, and Phoenix, which is why I don't think the icons being quote unquote summoned is going to be for combat, like in battle combat, I think it's gonna be reserved for cutscenes. Ifrit is almost like the size of a castle tower. Has shaped our history. Someone who is not Clive, someone with an ax and someone who is apparently rolling out of the way of getting clubbed by a giant wooden mace. So I think there's a chance, a pretty good chance that we will be getting playable party members. So here we see Clive, Super Clive, <laughs> Clive Batman, uh, very freaking cool, but also from a combat point of view, a little bit confusing. Is this one of Clive's actual moves, like down thrusting a Marlboro like a freaking Dragoon? Because that's basically what it is. He's moving like a Dragoon. Yeah, it might be a combo finisher or it might be just like a cutscene finisher too, actually. That is pretty damn cool. Actually, it sort of reminds me of Nero's arm from Devil May Cry 5, uh, the, the breaker, the breaker attacks. Although I don't think in this case, it'll be like a detachable arm, no. Maybe it's an arm that he gained, the, that kind of gauntlet that he gains. It might be something he gained as a result of like a bargain, like a devil's bargain. The Amano art having Phoenix and Ifrit be the centerpiece, I think more or less kind of confirms that this tragedy or some kind of tragedy that befell Joshua and Clive, maybe Jill, maybe their father, maybe the whole kingdom of Rosaria and this theme of revenge is going to be central. Phoenix fighting Ifrit, like fire fighting fire. That's that's interesting because you would think that it would be like fire fighting water, good versus evil, or you know, earth versus lightning or something. Having fire fight fire, I think really telling of the story as well. Because there's something that my, my writing teacher taught me. Drama or good drama or great drama isn't good against evil. It's good against good, like versus like. And then we explore the nuances of each of those likenesses. Fighting fire with fire has interesting implications in that fighting fire with fire actually just makes the fire bigger. It doesn't actually put the fire out. It just makes one fire bigger and bigger and bigger. This game's story is probably gonna be more sociological as opposed to psychological. Similar to the way tactics in Final Fantasy XII, it wasn't like a, a black and white kind of world. It wasn't black and white morality. The reason why it's so good for storytelling is because you're unsure how it's gonna turn out, which fire is going to win. My impression was that it was going to be a late 2021 or an early to mid 2022 at the earliest. But knowing that Final Fantasy XIV is gonna be releasing a like the 6.0 expansion, mid 2021, and also we have the, the pandemic and the work at home situation. Now, Yoshida did something very smart. He decided that for 16, he was going to be the producer instead of the 
producer director, super smart, giving to Kai the, the director's chair. Final Fantasy XIV patches are released like clockwork, uh, so I hear. So I think that we can trust Yoshida to put out the best possible game in a timely manner. So I'm fine with waiting because a delayed game can be good eventually, which I mean, so far everything looks great, but a bad game is bad forever. And Yoshida of all people at Square has taken that to heart. It's not gonna release in seven years. <laughs> I think Square at this point has learned the, the hard way that announcing games prematurely, like only to keep us waiting for like half a decade to get a potentially different game than what was shown. Like it was with like 13 and 15 and sort of seven remake. That's just bad press. Yoshida did say that 2021 is going to be the busiest year of my career. Busier than the crunch years of Final Fantasy XIV Realm Reborn. I mean, holy hell, I mean, that's already very reassuring right there. So I think 16 will be an early to mid 2022 game. And I think it might have originally been scheduled as a late 2021 game, but certain unforeseen circumstances in the world forced him to be more prudent. The provisional Peggy 18 rating, that was a rumor for a little while and I was kind of skeptical about it. And that's basically for the UK, uh, all of Europe, I think except for Germany, which uses the USK uh, rating system, the United States, uh, it's still ESRB pending, I think. Yeah, it's still ESRB pending, and the most important one, which is the Japanese site, uh, it should still be zero scheduled. Yeah, it's still zero scheduled. Here's what I think probably happened with the provisional Peggy 18 rating, and probably why it has a provisional Peggy 18 rating, but nothing yet for ESRB or zero. I think it's probably the violence. In America, we tend to be more prudent. We tend to censor more sex, but we tend to be more lenient with violence. But it's actually the opposite in Europe, where they tend to be more lenient with sex, but far more strict with violence. That's why I think if the Peggy 18 provisional rating ends up being actually Peggy 18, that won't translate to a rated A, which is, see, rated M in ESRB is actually not 18 plus, it's 17 plus. For those of you who are curious how this is going to turn out, I would say this, pay attention to the zero rating, which is the Japanese rating, because I think that's what's most likely going to determine the international rating. If Final Fantasy 16 ends up getting a zero D, like that's a big deal. Like most Final Fantasy games in the past, with the exception of like type zero, were ESRB teen rated or below, Peggy 16 and zero C. The fact that they're even willing to go potentially Peggy 18 with this game is gonna tell us a lot, which I imagine would happen sooner or later because you know, the Final Fantasy fans, we're not, we're not 16 years old anymore. We're not 12 years old anymore. We're not seven years old anymore. Like we're getting, many of us are getting older and I think even younger fans now are kind of expecting more rated M kind of games. Final Fantasy 16 will position itself to be the first Final Fantasy to take some crazy bold risks that have never been taken before. And one that will hopefully make those bold risks pay off. Here's what I want, here's what I wish, and here's where I'm seeing the Final Fantasy series going. No more middling experiences. Like Square's done this for so fucking long and it needs to change. And I think Yoshida is the one to break Square out of this kind of creative rut that was caused as a result of that. And when I say middling, what I mean is like taking the safe route, like Rated T, Peggy 16, Zero C, a, even for games that didn't warrant it, like a teen family friendly comfort food experience that's like kind of something for everyone, like a game that everyone sort of likes or really likes, but no one really just fucking loves. This is why I'm more hyped for Final Fantasy 16 over 7 Remake Part 2, because right now I'm convinced that Yoshida is not going to make a middling experience out of 16. In fact, I'm convinced that he's actually determined to ignite his fan base with something that's truly special. It's not just because that Final Fantasy VII Remake Part 2 and 16 are different games. They're also being made by two very different producers who have very different development backgrounds within Square. So Katase versus Yoshida. These are the big heavyweights right now. It's like commercial slash corporate square versus kind of like indie edgy square. Back in 1998, 1997, 1988, Final Fantasy VII was the flagship game. And Final Fantasy Tactics, which released like almost at the same time, was more of like the indie square game, kind of the offbeat indie square game. 
everyone who had a PlayStation played Final Fantasy VII, like even like non-Final Fantasy gamers. But not everyone even knew about Tactics. VII was the flagship epic experience, while Tactics was like the underrated epic hidden gem. And just my personal opinion, Final Fantasy VII was a great game, but I think Final Fantasy Tactics was a brilliant game. And I think that Final Fantasy XVI will be appealing more to the fans of Final Fantasy Tactics. You know, kind of like the edgy indie Final Fantasy, just with like a bigger budget this time. Like similar to the appeal that like Nier Automata has with its fans. Like game developers like Yoko Taro and Yoshida need like proper budgets to make their visions come to life. You think that 16 will sell more than 7 Remake if they do this correctly? See, between Katase and Yoshida, Yoshida is clearly the more indie of the two Final Fantasy producers, and his games will reflect that sentiment. Final Fantasy VII back in 1997, its commercial success back then, made the franchise, and not just the franchise, the specific game, so big that Final Fantasy VII Remake will have the onus of taking the safer approach, whereas 16 will have the luxury of taking bolder risks. It's not just like the mainline new entry to the series, but it's one that's coming from a producer whose bold risks have actually saved a mainline title. After Final Fantasy VII's original success, over the years it built up into this like big franchise even within Final Fantasy. So it's why VII was the only Final Fantasy to get like a full overhaul remake because VII has become like an empire within like an empire. But the, the problem that I think Katase was wrestling with is that the bigger you become, the less risky you're allowed to be. You have to be more conservative and that's the same with anything like companies, movies, Know, politics, because the financial risks is so big if you fail. That's why Final Fantasy VII Remake was rated T and probably a Peggy 16. The scene with the Genova and the Purple Blood, that was done specifically because they knew that the game would be played in China. And so VII Remake is like trying to capitalize and get the, the widest possible audience. So Kitase is like the rated T Final Fantasy producer to me, and Yoshida is like the potentially rated M producer, which isn't inherently good or bad, it's just very telling of their approaches. Because conservative means that you'll create a game with a mindset of appealing to the mass. Whereas with an indie game, your mindset is to create a game that you fall like really madly in love with, like Yoshida did with 14 or Realm Reborn, and hope that your audience will also fall madly in love with as well. Like it'll be like an energy transference. Even if it means that a smaller fan base will emerge from it, but that fan base will be even more loyal to your brand. And I think 16 will be a game that takes bold risks that will really resonate with its audience. I mean, Yoshida with uh, 14 or Realm Reborn has already proven that he knows how to make the bold risks pay off. When Yoshida proposed the schedule for rebuilding Final Fantasy XIV, all the, the normal people who worked on 14 1.0, they didn't believe that he could do it. They went through hell just to get Final Fantasy XIV 1.0 off the ground, and now he was asking them to go through hell again with no guarantee of success. So they had no logical reason to believe that he'd be able to do something that was so insanely impossible as turning 1.0 into a Realm Reborn within like two years time that he wanted to do it in. Those who did believe him, you know, My Hero, Soken, and Takai, like they're now a part of 16. They were part of Realm Reborn, but now they're a part of 16. They're risk takers who know how to make the risk pay off. That's why I think 16 is going to be like a special game because it's made by abnormal people who did believe in Yoshida. Here's the issue that I had. Here's sort of why I kind of fell out of Final Fantasy, like post 10, because this is what I sort of sensed. Square rode off the coattails of its previous successes, which started off with Final Fantasy VII success. And as a result, what happened was that it stagnated and innovated less and less. The development of the story behind Final Fantasy XIV 1.0 and the disaster that resulted as a result of Square's arrogance, its attitude with being stuck in its ways. Like that team, it was so ridiculous. Like 14's team, original team, like they were developing an MMO and they'd never even played an MMO. They never even played like World of Warcraft. They never knew why it became successful and yet they were building an MMO that they expected people to pay money for. So what I think would happen was that after Realm Reborn until now, Square is at a point where it realizes that it needs to take bold yet calculated risks in order for the franchise to survive artistically and commercially. When Yoshida took control of 14, he famously gave um, the CEO, what's his name? Um, 
Matsuda and the other square heads two options. Either you just patch up 14 and make the game just barely playable enough to recoup the financial losses, or you risk a financial loss by rebuilding the game from the ground up and be vigilant about making 14 the correct way as it should have been done from the start. So whereas others at Square and like the newer blood uh, may have forgotten the story behind Final Fantasy 14 1.0, Yoshida remembers. He remembers the hubris. He, Takai, Soken, my hero, they experienced it firsthand. And Yoshida and Takai realized that how bad it was just looking at 14 1.0 from the outside. They're not gonna allow that. I, I'm willing to bet money. They're not gonna allow that to happen to 16. Yoshida even gave like this GDC talk some years back outlining exactly what leads to failure in a Final Fantasy game going forward. The development of Final Fantasy 14 1.0, the disaster, I think may have been a blessing in disguise for not just 14, but 16 also. Like it taught Square how to take risks and how to make the risk taking pay off. Because as you said, like the risk taking, it breeds growth and excellence since you're always mitigating that risk with uh, striving to make the game better by learning and adapting and being at the top of your game at all times, not getting complacent anymore. Even if that means that the approach will lead to a potentially more divisive game. Because divisive games that are divisive for the right reasons can be like very memorable and super special. The corporate heads at Square, they realize this. And that's why I think they're putting so much faith in Yoshida by giving him a full reign control of the next mainline title. A Realm Reborn was proof that there's actually a direct financial impact as the result of the bold approach that Yoshida is taking. And with so many games out there, now, you know, so many games, so many movies, so many TV shows, the players now, us, we demand better and better. As a result of Yoshida taking those bold risks and saving Final Fantasy XIV 1.0, that actually had an effect on Kitase as well. The gist of it is that, at least with 16, I think Square is more willing now than ever to take this kind of riskier, yet extremely calculated gambit. Uh, with Yoshida holding the dice. So it, it may be like loaded dice that even the odds into their favor, but I think they're dice nonetheless. And that's that's really exciting because like Yoshida, I, and maybe this is just the optimist in me, I don't think that Square Enix has yet reached its potential. You know, maybe that is just like the dreamer in me speaking, but I think 16 is going to be that kind of game. It's the kind of game that's going to know what it wants to be. It's gonna know exactly what it is and it will unapologetically be it, and it will just kind of go for it with arms swinging out the gates. For those of you who were kind of around back when Final Fantasy started in the West back in the early 1990s, Final Fantasy at its roots has always been a divisive game. Like it was just by virtue of the genre. Like back then you had this genre of RPGs, JRPGs, anime and manga, uh, fantasy, Dungeons and Dragons, you know, <laughs> Magic the Gathering kind of nerdy bullshit that like socially inept guys and girls who couldn't get a date played, but those who did play them became fiercely loyal fans. While normal gamers, quote unquote, who probably had no interest in RPGs or Final Fantasy probably just brushed it off. But that was what classic Final Fantasy was. And that's what made it so good because it knew its fan base and it ignited its fan base rather than trying to appeal to everyone. And which is what I feel like the Final Fantasy series has been doing. Like it's trying to appeal to people who don't really normally even play the games. And so it created this kind of middling experience. Like it worried too much about what other gamers who weren't interested in fantasy, RPGs, JRPGs thought. And over the years, and I think it really started with seven, seven success, was that Final Fantasy became more mainstream and more commercially successful. And especially with the modern games, I saw this. It tried to be a little something for everyone. Like even people who would never even play an RPG that would give Final Fantasy a shot. So Final Fantasy as a series kind of became like comfort food, like a microwave dinner that you kind of pop in at the end of a long day. Whereas before Final Fantasy was more of a, a specialty entree that was niche, but it was really good if you actually gave it a shot. If Square can go forward with their Final Fantasy games with the same attitude of just owning it, owning what it is, even if it risks alienating the dabblers, I think that's absolutely the correct attitude to take. Given Yoshida's pedigree and from the interviews that I've seen with them, I think it's a game that's going to ignite its true fan base, which may not end up being the largest, but it will be the most fiercely loyal and vocal. I think that even Katase realizes this with 7 Remake. Like the whole Honeybee Inn sequence and the, 
the wall market section as a whole was, it was insane. Imagine, like Kitase, who is the far more corporate, conservative Final Fantasy producer at Square and less the indie, edgy, risk-taking producer like Yoshida, even he realizes that taking this same kind of bold approach with 7 Remake would pay off in spades, which it did. And that will hopefully carry into 7 Remake Part 2. That's not just my greatest prediction for the two games, but that's also my greatest hope. Just go for it. Expand your base for sure, but most importantly, ignite your base first, your true base first. Make them so excited for a game that you create with something that is just so uniquely spectacular that they'll tell everyone about it. Like I'm doing with all of you. We barely got a trailer and some website info, and here I am talking to you about it like a maniac. Final Fantasy VII Remake Part Two and 16 are kind of neck and neck with me in terms of hype, but 16 has the edge uh, because it's going to be the more risk-taking Final Fantasy. 16 isn't even out yet. It's already gotten a provisional Peggy 18 rating and a potential ESRB M rating. Like, can you imagine Katase making an M rated Final Fantasy VII remake? Though, I mean, I'd love to be proven wrong, but my feeling is that one part of him is ultimately going to, for understandable reasons, kind of have to dial it back. Given Katase and Yoshida's different backgrounds within Square, uh, the two games will be positioned differently within the Final Fantasy series to where I think both would be very special games, but 16's potential boldness and daring will yield something that will be truly special to its fans the way Tactics was special to its fans in 1998. So 7 Remake will, that will probably be like the game that will have the, the larger fan base, but I think that 16 will have the more fiercely loyal fan base that will absolutely freaking love the game. Like the next game of Thrones maybe? and cherish it as this kind of seminal influence in hindsight for the divisive risks that it takes. 15's director emphasized as like the gravest situation that the game found itself in, that the series needed to grow its fan base, but for too long it's been too afraid to take the necessary risks to make it happen. Because it's clear as crystal by now. The fan base isn't going to grow with them just creating more of the same middling, let's not rock the boat, stick to what we know Final Fantasy games. What's counterintuitive about the divisiveness is that if you do it for the right reasons, it can actually increase your fan base as well. You know, Game of Thrones was a very divisive series when it came out. I mean, and George R. R. Martin, he he went all out with the the sex and the violence in his books in the the '90s. But you know, TV shows in the '90s were all about you know comfort food, Ted Danson, uh, you know, don't rock the boat sitcoms. Uh, but now that you know, television and video games and everything is so saturated, going all out and being divisive for the right reasons is an asset. Because executed correctly, those are the, the TV shows and the video games that really grab your attention and hold it and make you a loyal fan. And that's what I'm hoping that 16 does. I want this game to be as violent and as sexual as it needs to be without becoming gratuitous. And while I think that 7 Remake is navigating more in that direction as well, I think 16 is just more naturally positioned to be the bolder risk taker of the two. And Yoshida and Takai at the helm means that 16's got a damn good chance at making those risks pay off. And, and this is why I think the, the success or the potential lack thereof of the next two Final Fantasy games are gonna be crucial. Both the Yoshida and Katase they have a lot of incentive now uh, to come out of the gate swinging with Final Fantasy games that are potentially game-changing, series-changing, maybe even genre-changing. Like it's, I think it's do-or-die time for both of them. Um, no more safe Final Fantasies. It's go big or go home. And it's time to really prove to us and themselves, like what, what have they learned from not just the past five entries, but maybe from all of Final Fantasy as a whole up until now. And I don't think all of this questioning, this existential questioning of what Final Fantasy is, would have happened without Yoshida. Because 16 could end up rewriting the book on what it means for a Final Fantasy game to be a classic Final Fantasy game. Like his intentions might have been to do for classic Final Fantasy as a whole, what he did for 14, which is basically rebuilding, rebuilding like Final Fantasy, classic Final Fantasy from the ground up and making it something like more spectacular than anything that we could have imagined or hoped for. And given how much 
Uh, Yoshida is a fan of uh, Matsuno. 16, I think, is Tactic's true spiritual successor. I'm convinced with that beyond a doubt at this point. At least in terms of like the world, characters, aesthetic, you know, story design, look and feel. When 7 Remake came out, I was like super excited for it. But what I really wanted was a Tactics remake, like a full-blown single-player medieval Game of Thrones high fantasy remake with the same kind of like political backstabbing. And 16 is the closest I've felt to that becoming a reality for years. Like I know it won't be like a remake remake of Tactics in the same way that 7 Remake was a remake of 7 Original, but like a spiritual remake in a sense. Yeah, it was a Dengeki interview with uh, between Yoshida, uh, Matsuno, and Oda, who is the, the lore writer for 14. Yoshida even admitted like openly that him and the entire Creative Business Unit 3, they are absolutely in love with Tactics and Final Fantasy XII and basically all of Matsuno's work. The return to Evelise raid in Stormblood that Matsuno was a, a guest creator for is a direct reference to Final Fantasy Tactics. Now they obviously changed shit, which I understand. All the references to Dalmasca and Rabanastre and um, uh, Rosaria, those are references to Final Fantasy XII. Yoshida's games are influenced by Matsuno's games, and the two of them uh, do share collaborators, such as My Hero, who is you know, Matsuno's spiritual successor as a writer. So I'm just waiting right now for, in the next trailer, I'm just waiting for like Agrius to just show up and like kick the shit out of Marlboro. And here's what I really want and think 16 is perfectly capable of pulling off. And if they do this, this will be a genre game changer. I want 16 to be a single player action RPG Final Fantasy going back to its medieval high fantasy roots. So, you know, crystals, job classes, summons, magic. But with an MSQ that's about, you know, let's say like uh, the standard 40, 45 something hours, but with periodic updates that further build out the world with new quests new worlds to explore, new characters, new abilities, and everything ties together like an intricately woven tapestry. Because you know what that is? That's the culmination basically of what Final Fantasy has become. It's a single player Final Fantasy game, but with MMO expandability. Imagine your favorite Final Fantasy game. The worst part about even the best games is that they end. And yes, you can play it and replay it but the difficulty is making the post-game content as engaging as the MSQ. But imagine if your favorite Final Fantasy game never had to end. Imagine if it were designed from the start in a way, just like a television show, in a way that allows it to go on forever, like building out and out and out. 14 did sort of already do something like this uh, with its expansion packs, so why not create the same experience but in a single player Final Fantasy game? Yoshida, of all the Final Fantasy producers, is the one that is the most prime and capable of making that happen. I I'm hoping that 7 Remake does this as well. Give us like the main MSQ, and then instead of having a like, new game plus, give us like DLCs where it constantly, like full full DLC games that constantly expand out the, the world of Midgar. So that way it's like the game, in a sense, kind of goes on forever. You know, if you build the the game's story designed correctly, you can make the game kind of go on forever and ever and ever. If 16 ever ends up turning to be Final Fantasy Tactics' true spiritual successor, and if they end up like building it with like the main MSQ and then like expanding it out with like MMO expandability, I I'd probably turn this channel into a Final Fantasy 16 channel. And I will unapologetically <laughs> devote myself to playing the game and replaying the game, read every piece of lore each and every day, uh, probably until the day I die, you know, because all in all, you know, as a Final Fantasy Tactics fan, 16 has been the long awaited game for me. And it's coming in a form that has me the most excited. Like 16 went from a game that I thought would be just another modern Final Fantasy rehash, identity crisis, disaster uh, that I'd pass on to becoming my most anticipated game of all time. Uh, surpassing right now even Final Fantasy VII Remake Part Two. 